countdown. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. This is Brian Hirsch from Central Region Headquarters. Uh, it appears as though we have 22 people on the uh, call today, and I do show that we're recording. Um, and I'll be using Camtasia today to uh, to record this broadcast. Um, I see my audio is good. Uh, Matt, can you give me a little bit of audio? I can. Test one. <laughs> you look great. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and mute my phone. And uh, I'll turn it over to Matt. Matt Lawrenson has uh, 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 spent with uh, uh, the Weather Service uh, a little bit of time in the CWSU branch, um, and uh, then and then uh, uh, spent some uh, critical time um, doing what uh, many things that we're we're going to see here in today's uh, uh, presentation from the command center, and trying to look at uh, different ways to uh, to view. TAF performance and IFR, um, uh, and, and how that uh, might be normalized with uh, varying amounts of IFR that we see seasonally. So, um, Matt, uh, we're all geared up. We have 26 people on the line, and I'll turn it over to you. Great. Okay. Thanks very much, Brian. Um, this, this work arose from uh, concerns uh, that were expressed back a few years ago. Um, about how pot and far were not representative um, in aviation GIPRA. So the CFO's office had actually um, prompted the Aviation Services Branch, what well, it was called at that time, now Space Weather, to, um, we were prompted to come up with something that worked better. And Performance Branch as well was involved with that. Um, so that's what started this work. And uh, I guess from what everyone knows, pot and fire don't necessarily work for everyone. In a lot of situations, uh, there's some things that don't necessarily make sense. Um, and uh, part of the issue is we need to delve deeper into the statistics. Uh, and so that's what we did, and uh, this is the outcome of that. A lot of people know that there's a correlation between IFR frequency and our IFR performance. So now we just have to quantify that. So this is the point behind this is just to get you familiar with this idea of how we can actually, based on the strong correlation between, uh, in this case, IFR performance, that's the example we're using is IFR, and uh, the frequency uh, that IFR occurs. Okay, so there's three points that I just want to uh, drive home with this. Uh, the first is that um, in order to summarize our performance, uh, using pod or far individually uh, is not a, uh, while it can be useful in determining uh, how your, uh, uh, the quality of, of your forecasting and how to, how to break down what needs to be addressed uh, individually, they should not be used to summarize performance. And I'll go into that a little more here with each point. The second is that uh, since, and we'll show how uh, the metrics are grossly influenced by event frequency, they should be normalized for the frequency. And then finally, the last point is uh, to use a moving average to evaluate progress and trends. We shouldn't be focused on month-to-month uh, -month or even year-to-year -year scores. We should be looking at the trend of scores uh, relative to past years. The biggie here, the big takeaway is the second one. Uh, that this, the other ideas are probably well known to you, or at least you're familiar with them. Uh, this, this second one, while the idea has been around a while, I found out, um, we have not typically uh, done this. Okay, so uh, also I just want to say before I go on, please at any point, if you've got a question, please go ahead and, uh, and jump in. Uh, while you may distract me a little bit, I will get back on track, and uh, I think it makes for a more robust uh, exchange. Uh, I don't want to be talking the whole time. So please, by all means, if you've got a question, jump right in. And if I don't hear you at first, shout at me. I don't mind that. Thanks. Okay, so point number one, 
pod and far uh, must not be used to summarize performance. Using an index is important. And this idea has, has been around a long time. Uh, Joe Schaefer uh, highlighted this in his paper back in 1990 about using CSI uh, as an indicator of warning skill. Um, he describes how any single statistic can't adequately do that, and that includes an index. But an index is far better at summarizing uh, a performance since it accounts for pod and far. In this case, critical success index does account for pod and far. And uh, uh, Professor Rober from uh, the University of Milwaukee uh, also highlights the idea that we need to um, uh, we need to uh, modify how we do verification based on what our needs are to match the to match uh, the objective of what we want to. Uh, discover or what we want to analyze. And so there are actually, I mean, we could use several indices. Um, CSI is, is a good one because it kind of hits in the middle, but we could use uh, just an average of pod and success ratio. Uh, or we could use total performance index, uh, pod times success ratio. Um, let me just stop right here because uh, success ratio, I need to explain, is, is really the same thing as FAR. FAR is, is uh, how many false alarms you get. Success ratio is the glass half full version of that. Its success ratio is how many false alarms you didn't have, if that makes sense. So false alarm ratio, how many times you cried wolf. Success ratio, how many times you were successful, how many times you didn't cry wolf. It's, it's simply just an inverse number, or a, a one minus far is success ratio. Uh, so let me, uh, let me put you on the spot, Brian. Um, uh, so if I have a false alarm ratio of, uh, let's say, 40, 40% 40 false alarms, mm -hmm. And if we're using whole percentages, uh, success ratio would be 100 minus the FAR. So, simple Correct. one. What would the success ratio be if all, our false alarm ratio was 40? Your success, your success rate, rate, well, you're, well, you're, you'd be, uh, what, 0. 0.6? Yeah, right. Yeah. So if yeah, you were so, using whole numbers, it would be 100 minus 40, which would be 60, or if you're using... Yeah, the actual decimals, that's right. One minus 0.4 would be 0.6. So that's right. And my right. good friends out there, and my good friends out there all know that uh, that means that we are failing the false alarm gift right. <laughs> well, so, but, uh, actually, our false alarms have improved pretty significantly. So I'll, I'll show that here, actually. So anyway, uh, that's, okay. that's um, in a nutshell, then, what, I'm, what we're driving at here with 0.1 is, is summarizing performance using an index. Uh, pot and fire are great for analyzing, getting into the, the meat of things, but to summarize performance, you should use an index. Okay, on to point two then. We need to account for IFR frequency, in this case, if we're looking at IFR, and we should normalize for it. Okay, a lot of information here. I just want you to first focus on the lower graphic. The lower graph is our annual, these are annual scores uh, for IFR. So the red line is the IFR frequency. And IFR frequency on all these uh, graphs is the same. It's the red line at the bottom. And the uh, y-axis for, for the red IFR frequency line is on the right side of these graphs. So let's focus on that, that lower graph again, just so we uh, don't have to look at everything at once here. Uh, the IFR frequency for the nation annually ranges between 6 and 8%. Is that, uh, is that pretty clear? Um, Typically, we range between 6 and 8%. Not typically. 
we have for the past 10 years ranged between 6 and 8% for IFR frequency. So that's how often IFR occurs, averaged over all the TAF sites in the nation uh, per year. So notice now our CSI score is the blue line in the bottom graph. Our CSI scores on the left y-axis range between 0.42 and 0.48. So we score a CSI score between 0.42 and 0.48. Notice how our performance scores, CSI, uh, correlates actually quite closely with how IFR frequency goes up and down. In years when IFR frequency is down near the lower end of the range, down near 6%, our, our performance scores are down lower. But, uh, and also notice now, pot and FAR, we've got our rather success ratio. Inverse FAR is a an, an slang term I use for success ratio. It's just an easy way to remember that it's related to FAR. Um, on the upper right is the success ratio compared to IFR frequency. And also on the left is pod. So you can see they all kind of correlate with IFR frequency. But the strongest correlation, just visually you can see, the strongest correlation uh, is with the CSI, and that makes sense. Pod correlates pretty closely, too. And you can see that our FAR scores, or rather our success ratio scores, on the upper right actually have increased pretty pretty uh, sharply compared to pod. And if you look deeply into the stats, you, you know that that's where we actually uh, are doing the best. We're not necessarily improving our, our pod as much as we are our false alarm ratio. So we need to account for both of those together. OK. And if you wanted to see the equation there, you can see on the left, on the lower left there, there's the equation for CSI, if you want to know. Uh, again, that's the calculation for it. So it does account for pod and far. All right, so let's break this down and look at per month. We've got the annual information. Now let's dig deeper and look at the monthly data. Now, annually, while we range between 6 and 8% for IFR frequency, you can see that the monthly range is a lot higher uh, for IFR, or a lot broader. IFR frequency on the, on the x-axis here, the horizontal axis, uh, for monthly scores ranges between 3% and 18%. So quite a bit more variability when you're looking month to month at the national data set. However, uh, our CSI scores don't vary nearly. Well, they do vary a little more. But we range between 0.3 and 0.6 CSI there on the y-axis. So it's an expanded range as well, which makes sense. More variability month to month. Now, uh, you can see that the data actually is ranges in a very tight uh, uh, that, that the variability in the national range is actually quite tight. And, the, you know, when you're averaging out a bunch of sites, uh, you, you eliminate a lot of the noise. So this is going to look a lot more, uh, the, the correlation will be a lot neater, a lot cleaner in a large data sample than it will for a local data sample. Anyway, let me zoom in here on the 0.3 to 0.6 CSI range and get a little better feel for this example. So the national monthly performance in the past 10 years, fiscal year 2006 through 15, you can see that we range between 0.3 and 0.6 CSI. The FI of our frequency ranged between 3% and 18%. So what jumps out at you here with this information. I'll give an example. Um, well, first of all, here's the trend line, and here's how significant the, the uh, correlation is. Um, with an R squared value, that's the equation of the line there. Uh, on the top is the equation for the trend line, polynomial or quadratic equation. Uh, 
it produces an R squared value of 0.878. So what this is telling us is, is that almost 88%, a little over 87% of the variability uh, in our performance scores is explained by IFR frequency changes. So I'm pausing to just kind of let that sink in. 88% of the variability in our performance is explained by changes in IFR frequency. That's what this statistical relationship is telling us of this valid data sample size. Okay, let me give this example. Right now, our, or at least the last time I looked, our IFR GIPRA goals were a pod of 65 and a FAR of 38. If you plug those into that CSI equation, that's a CSI of about 0.465. So I just I plotted 0.46 here on the graph. So this is essentially our GIPRA goal right here. 0.46. This is the level we need to score at. We want to score above 0.46. Okay, in the past 10 years, note that when IFR frequency was less than 8%, we almost never scored. There's one little dot there that's just like over 0.46. One month we had out of the past 10 years where we scored, we met our Gipper goal, or at least the current one, um, when the IFR frequency was less than 8%. Conversely, whenever the IFR frequency was above 8%, we always met our goal. Now there is one little monthly dot there around 10.5% uh, where we were right on the line. But you can see what's going on. The IFR frequency is the largest determiner, is grossly influencing our performance. And this has to do, I think, with uh, the way we verify uh, uh, IFR. We do it in five-minute bins. And I won't go into this too much, but it, it, this is just theory. I haven't got this completely backed up. But you, you think about it. Um, on a day where you've got low IFR, when you've got IFR that's socked in and you know it's going to continue for another 12 hours, you get a bunch of five-minute bins of easy scoring uh, verification. So the frequency of IFR goes up and your score goes up. It's just typical. It's, it's the, more, uh, the more chances you have at easier forecasting IFR, uh, the better your scores are going to be. Um, it, there, and I can't explain, I don't think that explains everything, but it's just an example of how you might think about why this relationship is true. But nonetheless, the, statistically speaking, we have, the, we have the evidence here that tells us um, what we're doing with uncorrected pod and far, if we're not normalizing for IFR frequency, then what we're doing when we use unnormalized pod and far is, is we're actually not measuring performance. We're measuring IFR frequency by proxy, essentially. Okay. I'm going to stop for a second and see if there's any questions about that. All right. Yeah, don't be shy. Yeah, don't be shy, everybody. This is a uh, this is a good opportunity to ask. So, eighty-eight percent of what we've always looked at, what we traditionally look at in terms of our verification, how well we did, is just how many at bats we have. Right. Um, there's there's that relationship. And so from here on, Matt's going to start to talk about how we might look closer at the remaining twelve percent. Right. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, that's very good. So let's do that. All right. All right. Okay, so here's a spreadsheet. And what I've done here, and this is I'll provide a template of a spreadsheet uh, uh, to you. It's actually in the email that I sent out. Um, 
a template where you can plug in pod and far and the IFR frequency, and the rest of the spreadsheet will populate as you see it here. So let me let me just emphasize one month as an example. So this is January 2012. So I just pulled out from the orange line there in the spreadsheet. So in January 2012, nationally, our pod score was 66.8. So that's a little better than uh, the current GIPRA, which is 65. And our false alarm ratio was 34. And that's a little better than the national goal of 38. So that produces a CSI of 0 0.4970. I think I have the equation here. Yeah, there it is. So we plug that, we plug those pod and far numbers in to the equation, and we get a CSI of 0 0.4970. So remember from the last uh, graph or the last uh, slide, I said our our national GIPRA goal amounts to about 0.46 or so, 0.465 for a goal, well, you can, that's, that means that a 0.497 CSI is a little bit better than uh, the goal, just as the pot and far are a little bit better than the goal. So that all correlates. So how does that compare to our IFR frequency? You can see our IFR frequency here is 9.07%. And that would be a little bit higher than average. So how do we weigh that? We got a little bit higher than average IFR frequency and a little bit higher than average uh, performance score. Let's take a look at where it fits on the graph. So measuring up from uh, the x-axis, IFR frequency, 9.07 or so. That you measure up from there, and then our performance is right here, 0.497. So the predicted score based on the past 10 years of data would be on the line. Right on the line would be predicted score. You can see we scored a little bit above it in January 2012. So that distance from the trend line is actually our normalized performance. That's our performance over predicted. So it's a relative score. The way that we derive this predicted score is from the trend line equation. We simply plug in uh, our frequency for the month, 9.07% in this case. We plug that in for x, because that is the independent variable. We're using IFR frequency to predict performance. So plug in 9.07% in for x. And when you do that, here's the numbers you get. The performance, the predicted performance score would be 0.477. And that's what this line, on the line right here, with an IFR frequency of 9.07, the predicted score is 0.477. So to measure what, or to quantify what our normalized performance is, then we subtract what our actual score is, the 0.49 CSI. We subtract what the predicted score would be and you get 0.02. So that's the distance between this dot and that dot, 0.02 CSI. So we scored 0.02 CSI higher than predicted. We did better than predicted. Now, we do that with each of these dots, each of these monthly scores, and plot them over time. And that's how we can see our trend. So here's where that January 2012 is right on the 0.02 line. And now we can see what our performance trend is normalized for IFR frequency. There's quite a bit of variability here, so it's a lot like the, it looks like the stock market kind of, you know, where you day-to-day uh, -day variability, volatility is high, but if you're a long-term forecast or a long-term investor, and that's what we are when it comes to performance, we are a long-term investor in our performance. We want to use a moving average. So that brings us to our third point here. To summarize point two, got to normalize for event frequency uh, in our aviation performance metrics. And point three, use a moving average to evaluate progress and trends. 
it helps us see the trend better. And not only that, each point summarizes 12-month performance. Uh, so it's useful. There's a lag. It's something to think about when you're looking at a 12-month average is you're looking at a 12-month lag. But that's, that's useful because you really are, you're really summarizing the yearly performance in each, at each point. Uh, so you can see nationally here, we kind of, we kind of flattened out here uh, from September 2008 to September 2013. Performance improved a little bit, but now we've jumped up again. And actually, that's interesting because uh, uh, we had some concerns about whether we were improving or not when I when we were, when I was first looking at this in 2013 14 time frame. So it's nice to see that we've uh, jumped up again. We've stepped up again. Uh, and interestingly, there's um, I'm going to just show this real quick here. There is a um, correlation between uh, performance of GFS LAMP and um, and that and that improvement that we we had nationally. So this is a graph. Take a look at the lower right here. Um, our improvement over LAMP dropped off in 2015. Now when I say dropped off, bear in mind we're talking about national uh, the national data sample here. Talking about all the tasks here averaged together. Um, so to get a big move in that uh, in that number, uh, a 0 0.01 uh, CSI move is significant. So we're we're moving along fairly flat lined here from August 2009 onward. Well, let's say the um, actually it's 2008 onward, uh, and this drop down tells us something. Uh, something was going on here, at least in the last uh, year or two. And if we look at performance of LAMP, and I did take a closer look at this with MDL, uh, and we look at the normalized figures, you can see that unadjusted CSI would suggest, now this is unnormalized CSI, if we're just looking at CSI, pot and far, nothing more, not, not corrected. There was a bump up back here in, in the 2009-2010 time frame that's almost comparable to the bump up in performance here recently. But when you normalize it, you can see that actually that bump up in 2009-2010 really wasn't as significant as this recent one. And if you talk to MDL, they did make um, significant changes to uh, the LAMP. Uh, I'm not exactly sure everything that they did, uh, but they made they made significant changes and were interested in looking at the performance since the beginning of 2015. And uh, this 0.01 in improvement in CSI is significant uh, for that large national data sample. So there, we'll be hearing more about that, I'm sure. Okay, enough on that. Uh, all right, going back to... All right, so uh, national moving average, a uh, lot easier way to see trends. So that's, that's our third point. As far as on a, a local level, or a single location example, or a group of tasks, such as uh, WFO's group of tasks, uh, using uh, Chicago O'Hare as an example, just a single location site, you have a little more variability in the data sample. So your R-squared value here, 0.58, it's not as high, uh, obviously, as the national data sample. More variability in the data, and that makes sense at a local level where you don't average out a lot of the noise like in the national data sample. But it's still useful, and the correlation is still significant, and you st we still need to account for IFR frequency. This will help um, in doing this. You can see in the lower right here is the 12-month moving average normalized performance for Chicago. Um, you still get a nice 
uh, lucid look at performance. Okay. You can even get down to a single forecaster uh, in normalizing performance. You, typically, there's going to be less data, so that needs to be taken with a grain of salt. But, um, I think I'm, I'm losing some people here with the stats. I'm going to uh, <laughs> kind of uh, get away from this in a second here and, and show you the spreadsheet uh, that you can use to do this for your site. And I just want to let you know, we're just starting with your tasks for your site. Um, but, but you can dig deeper into this. For each forecaster, you can take a look at performance. And the relationships are fairly strong, too. So you can see here for an individual forecaster at Green Bay, 0.6 is a good correlation. All right, and I just also wanted to mention real quick here, um, sometimes you will see, you probably won't see this in sensor region, but in other regions you'll see some anomalies uh, that make it appear as if you can't use, uh, you can't draw a significant correlation between frequency and performance. Um, you need to just dig deeper into the stats because, um, uh, for example, in Western region, uh, this looks like a data sample that, that can't be worked with. But um, if you break out it seasonally, you can see this uh, th This is an artifact of, of the climate, climatology. Uh, note that in quarter four here, so July, August, September, uh, for the past 10 years, performance is a lot higher. Uh, it has a totally different relationship during that season compared to the, the rest of the year. And this makes sense because it is strata season uh, during that time in western region. Performance uh, benefits from that strata season uh, uh, difficulty improved, or at least uh, it, it's uh, the easiest way to say it, is uh, it's a lot easier to forecast stratus uh, than at other times of year, IFR stratus, and the correlation is quite strong. Okay, I think that will do it here. I'm going to just uh, hit my points one more time. Summarizing performance, use an index uh, instead of just pod and far. And Account for IFR frequency um, using a normalization scheme. And make sure you use a moving average to evaluate your trends. Uh, the normalization procedure is um, something that was uh, published in the Journal of uh, Operational Meteorology, the NWA journal back in, uh, the online journal back in uh, late 2013. So if you're interested in uh, looking at the details, you can find them there. And uh, Bob Glan, actually, I found out later on, I certainly would have referenced it if I could have, but Bob Glan uh, actually did a paper on this back in 1970 uh, where he uh, normalized uh, POPs for frequency. Um, and his summary at the end of this paper uh, describes how your normalized scores should generally create a, a curve that raises over time. Um, for anyone that's interested in the uh, in the statistics part of it, uh, uh, certainly can pass this on along with uh, uh, Professor Rober's paper on on uh, verification. Okay, so let's take a look at. Uh, Let's take a look at the spreadsheet that, uh, distributed to everyone. Okay, so as I was, uh, let's see here, I need to get at that button. There we go. Let me uh, let me stop and see if there's any questions first. Okay. okay. So. I, I don't know if anybody wants to go back to any of the questions uh, or any of the slides before, but um, we do have uh, we do have a few minutes for questions here. We have uh, still have 25 folks on the on the line, so uh, 
I know we covered a lot of material, and before we get into the um, the spreadsheet, are there any questions? Yeah, this is Brian from Louisville. Hey, Brian. Yeah, I, I was curious. Have you ever um, also looked back at um, whether the models, if you have more frequency of IFR, if they tend to also do better? Absolutely. And uh, I, um, if you saw the uh, example that I gave here for um, for GFS lamp, uh, this this is the unadjusted right here uh, on the upper left. So here's just the normal scores for CSI for lamp. And um, did I include any others? I thought I had. Uh, so I looked at uh, all the models that were available in uh, Stats on Demand. And they're all pretty flat, except for, uh, well, GFS bumped up and GFS LAMP bumped up in the 2015 time frame. Now you can see that in the uncorrected data, you can see that they had a bump up. But then they also had one back in that 2009-2010 time frame. But if you normalize for frequency, IFR frequency, you can see that the bump up back in 2009-2010 was essentially related to the frequency of IFR, not in actual model improvement. So when, when it was normalized, you can see that, okay, that was a false signal here. That's IFR frequency that's bumping that up. When you normalize for frequency, you can see that here in the last year or two, we've had improvement, unlike in the past. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. And so that improvement, uh, that lamp improvement, GFS improvement, really, because you see it in the GFS data, too, um, that explains our bump up recently, too, in our own performance. Because, of course, when the models improve, we improve. <laughs> okay. Theoretically, we improve if the models improve. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I I'm happy to go back and cover anything. I appreciate your patience with this. I know stats aren't everybody's cup of tea, but uh, uh, there's a reason to go through all this. And... The background helps in in at least getting us prepared for how we can uh, use pot and far um, to to uh, to actually uh, get some good data instead of wondering if it's good. Um, and this spreadsheet here is is just the uh, I'm, I've simplified this as much as I can, and uh, I think you'll find that it's it's uh, useful. Um, but what I do need from everyone, if possible, is to just populate these scores for your for your TAF site, uh, TAF sites, and what you would. I, I've um, on the email that I sent out to everybody this morning. Uh, there's a copy of this spreadsheet template and a copy of instructions on how to populate it for the IFR GIPRA criteria. So I'll, I'll give an example of uh, what to do here, unless there's any more questions. Got a little bit of time. OK, good. OK, so here are, uh, here's a sample. Uh, this is in your template. But when you go through uh, Stats on Demand, and the instructions will tell you uh, what what criteria to to enter into Stats on Demand to get your get your IFR numbers, pod and far. Um, these look familiar. Go out to just go to two decimal places, whole numbers, and populate the spreadsheet with those. So I'll go ahead and go ahead and enter these. I'm going to just grab all these numbers here. Plug them into 
spreadsheet. <clears throat> and you might notice here, uh, this column here has a bunch of uh, hash marks, a bunch of number signs on it. That's just telling you that it needs to be wider to display the data. Easy way to fix that is to just to go up to the separating line here uh, at the top row for the, the header and just double click on that and that will spread it out to the uh, width that Excel needs to display the data. Okay, so I've plugged in my pot and far numbers. So I, let's say I went through stats on demand and did all these numbers, right? And here I've, I've put M pot and M far for model pot and far. So comparing GFS to it, I would go ahead and just plug these in. You might, because if you want to see the model performance, like I was, uh, uh, was it Brian in Louisville? I'm sorry. Or am I thinking of you, Brian? Um, you might want to populate these to look at your mo the model performance too, just so you can compare. As long as you're in there doing this on stats on demand, you might as well uh, get the model data in there too. So just plug in the pot of far, and again, I'm give I'll give you instructions on exactly what to, what to do. In fact, it's it's in that email that I sent. So plug in the pot and far. Now I'll take the IFR frequency right here for this column. I'll go and grab that from my sample data. Right here. All right. Now, once you've got those three columns populated from stats on demand, now as you do it, your graphs will populate with, with data. So CSI here is the middle chart. I'll just scoot over a little here. All right. So CSI, you can see uh, data is a little looser. You know, uh, the range is for this data sample is between 0.1 and 0.8. So it's a lot higher for the local sample. This is a forecast office TAF set sample. I won't say what forecast office. <laughs> That's ours. So, um, okay. So the trend line here, you can, the linear trend line, uh, did somebody have a question? Sorry. thought I heard a peep. Okay. The R squared value is 0.5. Uh, that's okay. But you can tell that there's probably a better relationship, a better uh, trend line to fit this data, something that curves a little more, right? So once you've populated your spreadsheet here, I can I can assist with figuring out a good trend line if you if you want assistance on that. Um, but it's actually now with, with Excel, it's just so much easier than it used to be. Uh, all you have to do is just right click on that trend line and format it. And you get a several different choices for trend lines. And in, since your R square is displayed, you can see that very easily as you switch from each potential uh, trend line. You want to find the best fit. And visually, that usually is something that you, it's just easiest done visually. And there's a lot of ways you can analyze whether it's it's your best choice or not. And there are modifications in statistics that you can use to improve it. For our intents and purposes here, you don't have to delve too deep into it. Just use Excel's uh, options here. It's really uh, it's very handy. So uh, if we use an exponential relationship, you can see the R squared does not improve. That does not look like it fits the data better. So go to your next option. We looked at linear logarithmic. Now that's quite a bit better. That fits the data quite a bit better. Looks pretty good. 0.58 R squared, so we've improved that significantly. But let's look at our other options. Here's polynomial. That's not too bad either. Although on the upper end it actually trends down, which that we don't want to we don't want a relationship that does that. This uh, power option is actually quite good too, and produces the highest R squared value, 0.62. So that would be something to consider as well. Overall, though, um, the log logarithmic relationship um, is is one that I think is probably uh, 
probably works the best for us. Um, most most offices, I think, in central region will will see in either a polynomial or a logarithmic uh, relationship as their best option. But anyway, um, that's something that uh, again, if you if you want any assistance with that, um, and I think that would be a good time to to see if uh, see what you're looking at is is best or not. I'm happy to help with that. Once you've got what you what you want, then you take that equation and plug it into plug it into your predicted score. So you actually would use this equation uh, and plug it into and plug it into the uh, into the column here. So let's see here. Now I got to remember my uh, I got to remember my um, Excel's uh, Excel's equations are a little bit different from. You have to put it in its uh, proper format. Six five two. I believe you do the log. Let's see here. I might have to look at this again. So anyway, um, you'll plug the equation into the predicted score. Oops, sorry. I've got to. I got to get rid of that. When you plug your scores in here, um, it will produce. Uh, it will populate these columns. Now they're populated right now, but I need to put a actually put a score into predicted score, or I'll put an equation into this column, derived from the trend line that you want to use. So this is a more complicated step. Uh, once you've populated these, again, go ahead and, and if you want some assistance with this, if uh, if Suze can can help out with this, or if uh, if you're comfortable with, uh, what I'll do is I'll send out format a format explanation for how to use this equation uh, and just translate it into the the Excel uh, format that you need. And um, I, I gotta, I'm gonna figure this out right now here. Sorry. While I'm doing this, I, I can take questions too. If anybody has any further questions. I believe I'm gonna do this right here. I want the log of. No. Okay. Let's see here. I'm having a see here. I'm gonna look real quick at an example here. Can't remember the format here, I'll get it in a second. Well computer slowing down here. Come on. Mm. Good time for a computer to slow down. So Matt, um, yep. uh, this is Brian Hirsch again. I, I, I mean, I think what's great to see is that uh, uh, we do have an upward trend over the last uh, three to four years. So things are, are moving in the right direction. Um, and this is just another tool for us to look at that, particularly for those who might, um, uh, you know, maybe your office has uh, has, has has been working hard on on your stats uh, the last year or so, um, maybe two years, and you're not seeing that improvement in your typical PODFAR, um, uh, I think the takeaway that some people might uh, uh, have from this is that if they, if they did uh, use this, they might see that maybe their numbers have dipped because the amount of IFR they've seen over the last season or two has been lower. Right. And, you know, uh, for folks that are switching to uh, DAS, uh, this will be useful, too, because, um, you know, 
uh, it's really important for us right now at this time to have a clear understanding of what our performance is and how it will change. And I'm assuming that um, once we once we work out the kinks with everything, once we get it running uh, the way we want to, we should see performance improve. Um, we may see a little drop down at first, and I would think that we would, you know, that would to be that would be expected. But uh, from that point forward, uh, I would expect to see that trend up. Um, anyway, it's a question of uh, whether we want to actually look at uh, something that's more accurate uh, or not. Maybe we don't want to. Uh, Bill Abling and Bismarck. Yeah, Bill. Uh, yeah, um, we graphed our performance uh, along with other offices, surrounding offices, and it's kind of amazing how well we correlate with our other offices, which either means, you know, the IFR is fairly widespread in the northern plains and we correlate well with that, or the models are all basically performing the same. Yeah. And it's sort of interesting to look at that. But I was kind of wondering if, as we transition to digital aviation, um, will this be a tool to effectively evaluate our, our performance in that realm? Well, it should be. Um, I mean, it's just uh, the, uh, the, the whole point uh, for, behind it will be to just have more accurate. I mean, for Central Region, I, it's hard to... Uh, we're we're one of the regions that benefits from, um, well, okay, take my office as an example. Uh, we, our, our climatology is such that we tend to have higher scores than most people because of our proximity to Lake Michigan. Um, our IFR uh, climatology just is, it allows for easier uh, accomplishment of higher performance numbers. Some we know that some locations are a bear, you know, for for getting right. I mean, like in the mountains, uh, certain TAF locations are a lot harder than others for forecasting IFR. Each location, each office has a different uh, climatology, a different level of difficulty compared to somebody else. And Western Region really is, you know, concerned about this because. We set a bar. We set a bar that's based on uh, frequency for the nation, and they don't have that frequency. You know, Las Vegas has a handful of IFR events. You know, in ten years. So uh, we've got to find a way. We've got to look at our individual performance, and when we do this, and we normalize for our own frequency of IFR, then we get a sense of how we're performing locally. So yes, I mean it absolutely will um, help uh, get a better, uh, more accurate uh, look at performance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. It's kind of refreshing to see a new statistic rather than the old POD FAR as you've been looking at for years. You know, to yeah. actually see something above or below a predicted trend line. That's kind of exciting. At least to look at something new. Good. I'm glad you think so. Um, yeah, hopefully, uh, yeah, some offices, you know, some offices will find that um, uh, that their trend hasn't improved. Um, that's the case here. I mean, we're pretty we're pretty flat. Our performance is pretty flat. And um, but what's good about that in the last couple of years, anyway, we've started trending up a little bit. And uh, I'm really anxious to see how uh, digital aviation services that. Uh, you know that that uh, Martian and Jerry and, and Brian have worked so hard on. Uh, I, I'm really interested to see how we can, how our performance will change uh, when we when we fully adopt that. All right, thanks a lot. Say that, well, I should say, well, I, say that I, I think it's great that uh, Bill and probably has nothing to do with the fact that I I just saw him last month uh, up in Bismarck. That uh, that Bill put in the plug that this is exciting. <laughs> So after after 50 minutes of uh, of charts and graphs, this is exciting to Bill. Um, I, I, I hope everyone else is feeling the same way uh, because it's, it's it's a new way to look at these things. You, you know, uh, many of us have uh, uh, have looked at our GIPRA numbers and said, 
hey, you know, our flash flood numbers didn't look that good this year, but we only had, you know, six flash flood warnings this year. You know, for whatever reason, we were in the drought. We got, we, we didn't have any at bats. Um, so our numbers are low, or your numbers are great because you had six at bats and, and you hit six home runs. Um, but that doesn't uh, that doesn't really reflect what you might see over a whole season. So um, uh, I think that's what this uh, this says, and that's why uh, uh, Bill and Bill, your check is in the mail. Um, uh, considered this exciting. Um, we're at 55 minutes. We've had uh, just um, two or three questions from uh, 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 from the Kentucky and North uh, North Dakota offices. Um, uh, any anyone else? Uh, we we do have some time, so I'd, I'd like a couple of questions. Maybe I can ask a question, um, Brian. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm interested in knowing if folks, it takes about, in total, an hour and a half uh, to populate the pot and FAR and IFR frequency numbers. The first time I did this, um, when I populated them, it took me about an hour and a half. Um, so. It's not a lot of work um, to do this, uh, but it would be for me to do it for the entire region. And so I, I kind of am interested in uh, getting your help with it. Um, if you can populate the numbers from Stats on Demand, then uh, I can get, it takes me uh, only a short amount of time then to uh, get the final numbers for each office. Um, so uh, I guess what I'm asking is, is if folks can do this, if if you could populate this template that I've sent out to you with your uh, pod and FAR and your IFR frequency, and if you have the time, the model pod and FAR too, if you want to look at that. And that will give us a, a baseline to start with. Uh, where we can just uh, we can take a look at uh, how individual performance looks, and uh, again, I, I guess all I'm interested in doing is is having everybody at least get a look at this and how to do it. I'm not interested in at this point uh, trying to uh, trying to define uh, GIPRA goals or anything like that. It should be more about your your own office performance. I think that's a great uh, a great goal. We'll see. Um, uh, I know that uh, you, Matt, have uh, uh, some instructions on how to uh, uh, you know how to do this so that it's it's more of a plug and chug. And certainly, to download the data over the last uh, number of years is something that um, if if we could do over the next uh, couple of months, be something that you could give to your MIC and say. This is this is what I've done as the aviation focal point, and you know what do you think uh, of our aviation program and where we need to go? Um, do you, you know what do you see? Um, so uh, this um, this is the kind of kind of uh, uh, thing that that uh, if your instructions are 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 good enough, and, and I'm looking at them right now, um, this could give us a a good conversation piece with our MICs to to start to look at. Um, you know where we are with aviation at each office. So can you go so can you through, through uh, what you have? Sure. So uh, when you go into stats on demand, uh, the aviation, uh, the IFR rather criteria here, uh, I've defined. So just when you go into that first page and you're defining everything that you want, um, those are right here. And then when you get the output, when you get the scores, you'll get uh, you'll you'll uh, get the normal output where you can just drop down to the bottom of the page and get your pod and FAR scores. If IFR frequency is in this little uh, a little threshold grid, uh, and that probably looks familiar to you. 
and then you just plug them into these columns here. And uh, as far as uh, defining, once you've got the, the the graphs populated again, it's probably easiest if you want uh, to just contact me and uh, figure out what your trend line should be, and then how to populate that in your predicted score column. Once you do that, you'll be done. And that's that's pretty easily accomplished. The big thing right now is just to get the pot and far and IFR frequency numbers into a spreadsheet. And uh, that's mainly explained here on this first page of those instructions. Okay. Um, well, you'll, did you already send that here today? I did download the, the files just in case we had a problem with the uh, presentation, but was that part of the package earlier today? Yes. That was the last okay. uh, last attachment to the email that I sent out this morning. All right. Um, I guess next steps, um, uh, I, I think uh, this is something then that uh, uh, I can send out um, uh, from from what you sent here this morning, to make sure everyone has an understanding that we'd we'd like to see you maybe uh, do this at your office and then um, uh, have that conversation with your MIC and say this is where we're at in our program. And I did you know I I, I did look at uh, um, you know at where we're at and um, then uh, maybe share this data not with me. I don't need it necessarily regionally. You know, I'm not going to do anything with these numbers. I'm not going to drill down to to see what everybody's doing, um, but maybe share these numbers back with with uh, with Matt. And in that conversation, um, he can construct, you know, maybe a regional trend. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and do a regional uh, uh, analysis of of normalized uh, performance. Uh, that's something that I did do earlier, but I, I that was actually a couple of years ago. So I'll refresh that, and I can share that with everybody. Okay. All right. All right. Well, I see we're at the top of the hour. Um, uh, final uh, uh, final comments, Matt. Final questions, anyone? I really appreciate everybody's time. Thanks for your patience with this. And thank you, Brian. Appreciate no, I saw a presentation today, and I saw a presentation today, and I heard somebody use the word exciting. So uh, it it will be the only time it will be used during during my week today, or my conference call today. I'm sure. So um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, it looks like the recording has went well. I'll go ahead and end the recording, and uh, uh, see about shipping this out. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks, Brian.